old flesh, dirt, maggots, and ghosts. Our job is to keep them where they belong. It's your first night, so you'll need this. A ghostly lantern for ghastly tinkering. You'll learn to peer into the souls of the dead. You'll learn how to twist them. Meet me in the necropolis. You can pilfer shiny things from a corpse. But you can pilfer glorious things from a soul. I need a grave digger. This skill fires an arrow into the air that creates a small plant where it lands. The plant sends out tendrils to nearby enemies, slowing them down and poisoning them. But it does have another function too. If the plant gets further poisoned, it transfers that poison to the monsters it's attached to. Normally you would only be able to get one stack of poison on a monster at a time, but you can put as much poison as you want on this plant. You could just use the plant to slow monsters down and not worry about the poison part. But if you want to go all in on poison, this is the way to do it. Now if you do want to focus on poisons more, another useful skill is Poison Bloom Arrow. This skill creates these plant pustules on the ground. If you wait a little while, they'll explode. Just like any other plant skill, these plants respond well to poison. Shoot the Poison Burst Arrow at enemies nearby and watch your plants grow more and more powerful. Poisoning the pustules causes them to do much more damage and makes them explode much faster as well. I can also add the Pierce support to Poison Burst Arrow. Doing this will mean I get multiple Poison Bursts as it goes through each monster. We also have another skill to make a nice environment for your plants to grow. Gas Cloud Arrow. This skill shoots the ground and creates a cloud of gas that continuously poisons things inside it. Throw your plants down, then put a gas cloud on top. The constant poisoning will make them grow. Another poison related skill we have on the ranger is called Plague Bearer. This is a reservation skill, meaning it uses spirit. When I enable it, I get this counter that counts up whenever I apply poison to a monster. You can see the counter on the skill increasing as each new monster is poisoned. Now I'm going to fight these monsters and make sure to poison them as much as I can to build up the counter. It does take quite a while to get the counter up to 100%, but it's worth it. Whenever I choose, I can unleash the poison in a big explosion around my character, dealing a large amount of damage. Now next up we have a classic, Rain of Arrows. It's simple, shoot a bunch of arrows in the sky and they rain down for a short time. It's decent AoE and damage at long range. Now this skill doesn't last too long, but we can change that. It's time to introduce Frenzy Charges. Frenzy Charges are used for a variety of skills on the Ranger, but with Rain of Arrows they can be used to extend the duration. How do we get some though? 
Here we have a skill called Sniper's Mark. Put it on an enemy and it will grant you a frenzy charge when you crit them. Now remember that snipe skill from earlier? That skill guarantees a critical hit. So first we Sniper's Marked an enemy, then we sniped them. And after that, the next rain of arrows will last a really, really long time. We still have some weaknesses though. While Rain of Arrows hits enemies with a ton of arrows, each one doesn't do much damage individually. It would be nice if we had a way to break the armor on enemies so that Rain of Arrows dealt more damage. Thankfully we have this Corrode Armor support gem, and we can put it on our Gas Cloud arrow. Corrode Armor causes poison to erode the armor on targets until it's all gone. This will significantly increase the damage that Rain of Arrows does against armored targets. Oh yeah, and one more thing about Gas Clouds. They can be detonated with explosions. I have an explosive arrow here. Let's check it out. Now, because monsters and gas clouds are likely to have their armor broken, I think there's another useful combo we can do. This is an exploit weakness support. This support provides extra bonus damage to targets that have their armor broken. Perfect for what we have going on here. So, those are just some of the skills we have on the Ranger class in Path of Exile 2. Now that we've seen all these skills, let's see how well they do against a much tougher enemy. It's time to fight the boss Another of the temples, Thanos. Katava's cursed madness never ends! Only his reign! starting point is moving while shooting a bow. Any kind of basic arrow skill can be fired while moving, with a movement penalty. This immediately gives you a lot more freedom on the battlefield. Here I'm starting each battle with a poison burst arrow to poison groups of enemies, then using a lightning arrow to arc lightning around larger packs. For even more mobility, we also have a variety of skills that involve vaulting around the battlefield too. This is Frost Escape. Using it jumps backwards and shoots a freezing arrow at the ground. Really useful if monsters close on you and you need to get away. Once you've landed, if monsters were frozen, it'd be nice to have some way to take advantage of that extra time. This is where Snipe comes in. Snipe is a skill shot that you need to charge up and release at exactly the right time. If you land the right timing, Snipe is guaranteed to produce a critical strike and does a small AoE as well, so it's a great finisher. 
You can also move while shooting arrow rain skills too. This skill is Lightning Rod. It shoots an arrow into the air that sticks into the ground and does a small AoE. Once the rods are in the ground though, they attract any arcs of lightning that are nearby, causing them to explode again. This means you can stack up a bunch of lightning rods on the ground and bounce lightning between them, doing way more damage. Now this takes care of packs pretty well, but for bigger enemies I'd like to have something that's going to enhance my damage output too. This skill is Stormcaller Arrow. Using it sticks an arrow into an enemy. After a short period of time, a lightning bolt comes from the sky and strikes them. This has a high chance to shock them, and shocked enemies take 30% more damage from all sources. If something big walks along, it's a good idea to throw one of these at them first to enhance your damage, before following up with the other combo. I might also add faster projectiles to make the lightning rods land faster too. Now next up I'm going to grab this chain support gem. Chaining causes many effects to repeat on new targets when you hit them. If I add it to my lightning arrow, it will cause the arcs that come out of lightning arrow to strike even more targets, rippling along my line of lightning rods for huge amounts of damage. This support makes it so that any enemies shocked by the skill will also have the shock jump to nearby enemies, meaning they'll take the extra damage as well. It's just a chance to proc, so it's not going to proc on every single pack, but when it does, a pack will go down ultra quick. Another useful empowering skill is Barrage. Barrage is one of the rare cooldown skills in PoE 2. It enhances whatever your next attack is to fire three times. With what we have here, I think it might be a good idea to use it with Lightning Arrow. It'll generate three times as many lightning explosions. You could also use it at just the right moment with Snipe, or any number of other skills depending on what effect you need more of right now. It's very versatile, and can be used in a range of situations. Now, even as mobile as the Ranger is, it's still very useful to slow monsters down, and a Ranger certainly has quite a few tools to do this. If you're prepared to get up close and personal, we have a skill called Electrocuting Rod. First jump over the enemy and shoot it into them. Once the rod's in place, any lightning damage they take will build up a special Electrocute Gauge. Once the gauge is full, the monster is totally suppressed, allowing you to kill them easily.
Time to earn your keep. When you are ready, you can visit the morgue to view the monsters you have collected, and then get to work burying them in one of many graves in Aramor Cemetery. For example, we will bury this Katava's Herald. Aramor's mysterious soul experiments can coalesce powerful items. Here I've chosen to create a pair of boats. Of Lunaris, heal your pains and aid this soldier so that you may grace them with fleetness. These boots are useful for my character, but aren't exactly what I hoped for. And this is where the Necropolis crafting system really shines. You'll have noticed that the corpse we collected earlier had a crafting effect on it. In fact, all collected corpses do. If you bury multiple corpses in the cemetery, all adjacent corpses can be exercised at once to create one item. All of the crafting effects on those corpses will apply to that same item. This allows you to have either one or many different crafting projects ongoing in the cemetery. For example, next time I try to create boats, I could bury corpses that increase the chance of getting move speed modifiers. To go further, I could use these to generate higher tier modifiers. Then I could try to bias it towards being an evasion pair with this. Finally, I'll apply some crafting effects that improve the probability of getting good rolls. Now, let's craft our item and see what we get. As you can see now, we have a much better pair of boots, forged from the souls of our enemies. You could even use the entire cemetery to craft one item. There is always something you can do to try and ensure your item will be as best as it can be. We hope to see some really crazy grave crafts. If you are lucky, you might find corpses with meta crafting modifiers. These can be buried to manipulate your crafting projects in more drastic ways. This one increases the potency of all crafting effects of adjacent undead corpses. Another meta crafting modifier gives a chance to drop an extra item from your craft, with all the same crafting outcomes applied. All you have to do is bury a lot of undead monsters. May the ferocity of Throldana free you of your anguish and aid this soldier, so that you may shield them from harm! You can also craft new unique items exclusive to the Necropolis League using this system. As you explore Rayclast, you might find the corpses of famous Eternal Empire families. And when you bury an entire family together and exorcise them, they will thank you with a unique specific to their lineage. May the painters and poets of the Navalius family spread the story of the Eternal Empire far and wide, so that all may... For example, the Navalius Inheritance Belt. I'll give you a moment to check that out. You can use other corpses alongside them to grant implicit mods, manipulate the values of explicit mods, and more. In this case, with the Parandus Pact, you can even change the modifiers it generates. This unique is a jewel which adds extra stats to passive skills in a radius when socketed into the passive skill tree. The stats it adds are randomly generated, but you can bias it towards a specific type by using other crafting effects, such as this one which increases the chance of getting life modifiers. Let's see what we get. Damn, we didn't get it this time. I guess we're gonna have to go and collect more corpses. Of course, you can trade the corpses away to other players. All you need to do is purchase empty coffins from The Undertaker and use them on your corpses in the morgue, which will itemize them. Another item in the Necropolis League that you can find are Embers of the All Flame. These are monster spirits that remain living in the All Flame, a powerful ancient artifact of Rayclast. And you can set them free by placing them in the Lantern of Aramor and defeating them. These embers drop throughout Rayclast as itemized packs of monsters. You are able to use these packs to replace the packs in areas. For example, we have found this all flame ember of Tarfor. We can now go to enter the next area and replace one of the monster packs in here. 
You can see we have also gotten one of the devoted modifiers to appear. We can pair up the Karui ancestors with this modifier, making them even more rewarding. Let's go ahead and replace the tentacle miscreations. However, when replacing packs, you want to double check their density, as the new pack will inherit the density of the replaced pack. The Karui ancestors we have now added to our area can even drop basic variations of tattoos. If you aren't aware, this is an item type from the Trial of the Ancestors League, which can be used on passive skills to change what they do. There are many different types of itemized packs. You can find Breach and Legion monsters that drop splinters, untainted packs that provide insane amounts of experience, and even simple frogs, which can be used to replace difficult monsters to make life easier. And of course, these Ember monsters can be raised as Spectres too. Finally, let's discuss how this league works in in-game maps. Each in-game map will allow you to manipulate it using the lantern on the map device UI. However, instead of randomly cycling every few minutes, it is fixed to that map. Once you view the map through the lantern, you cannot remove it from the map device, so you can't trade that map away now that you've seen it is too difficult for you, or has monsters in it that you'd rather avoid, like porcupines. We're also trying something new this time around. During the Necropolis League, there will be support for the League on the Atlas Passive Tree. Multiple clusters will be there, allowing you to enhance the gameplay, customize it, and even change its behavior in meaningful ways. One way that you can change the crafting in a meaningful way is with the Prospero's Wager Keystone. With this keystone, all the monsters with unresolved anguish come with this crafting modifier which causes them to generate a random craft when buried. This means instead of pre-planning your crafts, you have to adapt to them on the fly to get the best results. These clusters will not be available in Standard League. In 3.24 we've made a plethora of changes to the endgame. We've introducing new bosses, adding another tier of maps, and streamlining the Atlas. The most difficult and most rewarding content in Path of Exile can be found in Uber Pinnacle bosses such as the Maven and the Searing Exarch. Currently, the only way to access these bosses is by allocating specific keystones on the Atlas Passive Tree. While this system offers a nice element of control, it causes a problem. Rewards and access to the non-Uber variants are now economically priced around the rewards of the Uber fights. This means it is wasteful to run the non-Uber variants instead of simply selling them. Another problem that we noticed is the difficulty jump between the Pinnacle and Uber Pinnacle content was relatively large, and there wasn't obvious content that could bridge this gap. Many players would give up on their characters before being able to defeat the Uber Pinnacle bosses. In 324 we will be making some changes to this. We are removing the keystones that give access to the Uber Pinnacle bosses from the Atlas Tree, and instead we'll be adding a new set of fragments that give you access to this content. Where do you get these fragments? We are adding a new tier of maps, Tier 17 maps, which not only give you access to the Uber Pinnacle content, but also test your characters in new ways. They feature a new set of bosses, Uber monsters, and a new tier of modifiers that can roll on the maps. There are five new Tier 17 maps in total, with some surprising boss fights at the end. We'll look at a couple today, and the rest you'll have to discover for yourself. First, we have the Citadel map. This map contains an ancient Kalgurin Citadel. You will encounter many expedition monsters as the signature packs throughout the map. At the end, you will fight Uber Uhtred. This is a version of a boss from Expedition League, with all its abilities and mechanics enhanced. Uber Uhtred will even be able to summon two other expedition bosses to aid it during the fight. Secondly, we have the Fortress map. This map is an impregnable fortress, guarded by monsters from the Heist League. At the end, you will encounter an uber version of the Unbreakable. Again, it has enhanced abilities and mechanics you'll have to learn and overcome. Each of the Tier 17 map bosses has a chance to drop a unique item, allowing for some target farming. However, these aren't entirely new unique items. Instead, we've taken other unique items, removing them from the core drop pool, and rebalancing them to fit here. One example is this reworked version of Wraith Lord. It has four Abyss Sockets, and allows you to summon an additional Spectre for each Ghastly Eye Jewel socketed into it. Another example is Mana Storm. This has been rebalanced to grant a lot more damage than before, 
alongside some more impactful mana stats, if you can get lucky rolls. Alongside adding tier 17 maps, we have also changed the uber pinnacle bosses to have completely distinct unique item drop pools from their non-uber counterparts. This means there is a reason to farm both versions. Let's take a look at the Shaper versus the Uber Shaper. The Shaper will drop these uniques. Voidwalker, Shaper's Touch, Solstice Vigil, and Dying Sun. Whereas the Uber Shaper will drop these. Echoes of Creation, Sublime Vision, Entropic Devastation, Starforge, and a new unique belt called the Tides of Time. Another example of a new unique is this helmet from the Uber Eater of Worlds, Ravenous Passion, and these gloves from the Uber Searing Exarch, the Celestial Brace. Each of the Uber Pinnacle bosses has a new unique added to their drop pools. We have identified another major problem with the endgame we'd like to address. With every expansion added to the game, we have been increasing the complexity of running maps. It's at the point now where a player must repeatedly execute a large sequence of steps to run maps efficiently. It can be easy to forget critical steps, and it can be tiring to repeat them. To solve this, we are removing some systems, but are keeping what is good about them. The two main systems we've removed are Sextants and the Master Mission Selector. It is not our intention to dull the content, however. We have completely reworked Scarabs to include most of the options that were previously covered by those mechanics, and many, many more. Let's take a look at some of them. Commonly, you might find Scarabs that simply grant access to different content. Here, we have a Scarab that causes Beyond Demons to spawn when killing monsters in your maps. And here, we have one that adds a Delirium Mirror. Each type of Scarab now has multiple versions, so if you want to fully invest in a type of content, you can do so. Here's a suite of Ultimatum Scarabs. This Ultimatum Scarab adds an Ultimatum Encounter to a map. This Ultimatum Scarab of Bribing then causes that Ultimatum Encounter to grant better rewards and its monsters to yield more experience. This Ultimatum Scarab of Dueling will cause that Ultimatum Encounter to always guarantee the Trial Master boss fight at the end, assuming you can survive through all the rounds. This Ultimatum Scarab of Catalyzing will cause all rewards from that ultimatum to be catalysts, instead of other rewards. And finally, this ultimatum scarab of inscription will cause all catalyst rewards from that ultimatum to be inscribed ultimatums instead. There are plenty of others. If you enjoy divination card farming, you might want to use these. This divination scarab of curation causes more divination cards to drop for each different favoured map you have selected but it also causes whatever map you're running to only drop divination cards from those favoured maps. So if you want to try and aim for your mage blood and don't want to just farm Crimson Temple, then this Scarab is for you. This Divination Scarab of Completion causes your divination cards to have a 20% chance to drop as a full stack instead, for maximum dopamine. Basically, there are now just a lot of Scarabs. You might have also noticed that they no longer have tears. Scarabs are now all world drops. You can get them anywhere. Some might be rarer than others, but the intention is that there'll be a lot more options than before, and more interesting combinations to consider. If you want to target specific Scarabs, Betrayal has been updated to include most of them, and you will need to relearn which ones come from where. While this system is allowing you to heavily invest in one type of content, it is reducing your capacity for variety. To address this, we have massively increased access to content on the Atlas Passive Tree. You are now able to reliably get different leagues like Breach or Legion from just your Atlas Passives. Regarding Master Missions, content such as Incursion, Delve, Betrayal and Bestiary, these two are now accessible with Scarabs, and have more reliable investment options on the tree. Not only this, you can now get Jun, Einhar, Alva and Nico to appear together in the same map. We have also removed some keystones such as Wandering Path, Grand Design and Growing Hordes, but have added some new ones too. For example, Unwavering Vision, Back to Basics, and Thorough Exploration. And we have added some new notables such as Remarkable Relics. 
but allows you to try find better variants of scarabs. Mounting modifiers, which increases the values of modifiers on your maps by 2% for each explicit modifier. And tainted carapaces, which is just one in a set of many that allow you to target farm specific types of scarabs. These are just a few of the many new notables that can be found on the Atlas Passive skill tree. Lastly, we are giving you more flexibility in what content you want to run in the endgame. In 324, you can now have multiple copies of the Atlas tree, which can be swapped between maps at your leisure. You can unlock up to two extra trees for a total of three by progressing through the endgame and completing core content. When you open a map, you can select which tree you would like to use. For a given league, you'll never feel constrained to playing your endgame a single way. You can also label your trees to easily identify which one has which content. With all this combined, we're hoping to see new endgame strategies shine through. While playing through the campaign in 324, you'll notice a myriad of small improvements and surprises. The fundamentals of the campaign are still intact, but we've scattered fun encounters and secrets throughout Rayclast. The Dweller of the Deep has been trapped. What are these ritual shrines doing in the northern forest? And why are they giving me omens? This device looks safe. I should definitely use this on my items. There are plenty more encounters to discover. We'll continue adding more surprises in future releases. So keep an eye out. In the previous expansion, 323, we released a large number of transfigured skill gems. These are alternate versions of existing skill gems that function in very different ways, allowing for more build and gameplay variety. At the time, our aspirations were higher than we could achieve. We planned more gems than we could make. So, in 324, we're adding another set of transfigured gems that we have now finished. Ice Shot, Incinerate, Artillery Ballista, Tornado, Elemental Hit, Kinetic Blast, Poisonous Concoction, and lastly, Summon Holy Relic. Hopefully those of you who missed your favourite skill having a transfigured variant will get that here. We will certainly be adding more of these in the future, especially for skills that are missing them still. Of course, we'll also be doing a balance pass on the existing transfigured gems. One of the main ones we're looking at is Kinetic Bolt of Fragmentation. As a result of this change, it is clear that the endgame potential of the Wanda archetype really starts to suffer, mostly in the single target damage department. Due to this, we've added the new support gem, Sacred Wisps. This support gem causes supported skills to create two attached wisps for a duration. With these wisps, whenever you attack, they have a chance to also use the same skill, if you have enemies in your presence. And if there are any rare or unique enemies, they will- The Solar and Eldritch Packs. Each tier contains the full pack's face value and points, alongside several exclusive microtransactions. These packs are only available for the duration of the Necropolis League, and will leave the store forever when it ends. As always, the microtransactions in these packs are purely cosmetic, and do not affect your character's power or progression in any way. The Solar series of supporter packs contains six exclusive microtransactions. The Cosmos Weapon Effect adorns your weapon with stars. Hitting enemies causes cosmic energy to spill out into the area around them. The Radiant Orb of Chance Extra Effect projects the outcome of items you've used an Orb of Chance on above your head. Remember to congratulate other exiles in town if you see them chance a powerful unique item. Shine boldly with the Solar Knight Armor Set. The power of the sun radiates from your body getting more and more intense as you use skills and emitting solar flares as you run. With the supernova level up extra effect, the dead will be raised from the ground around you, before being obliterated and turned to ash by an epic supernova whenever you level up. This one is my personal favourite. The Cosmic Turtle Hideout lets you travel the infinite expanse of the cosmos atop the back of a colossal turtle. Carry the weight of the sun on your back with the Solar Guardian back attachment. Witness it grow larger and larger as the energy of slain enemies is funneled into it. When it reaches its maximum size, it goes supernova and turns into a black hole, forever drifting throughout Rayclast. 
The Eldritch Pack series also has six exclusive microtransactions. Are you wondering if we move the stash on the latest patch? Don't be fooled, because with the Mimic Stash Pet, players can transform into an image of a stash when in a town or hideout, and scare unsuspecting exiles. This pet follows behind you with its terrifying hand walking the rest of the time. The Shaper's Slam finisher effect sends slain unique enemies into a final abyss of unending darkness. The Eldritch Hunger armor set contains a beast that demands you to feed it by embracing your bloodlust. Watch it grow in power the more you kill until it bursts from the shell of the helmet. Are you able to satiate its hunger? The seed within the Corrupted Growth map device expands its grasp on your hideout the more maps you complete on your atlas. Equipping the Headhunter character effect causes skulls of slain rare enemies to whirl around you like trophies. They become enraged when you are near a rare enemy you are yet to kill, wishing for them to join your collection. We've added the Automation and Call to Arms skill gems, for being able to trigger instant skills and war cries without having to bind them to left click. You can now hold down Control and left click to automatically apply certain currency orbs until they achieve the desired result, or you run out. For example, you can hold down Fusings until you reach maximum links. You will be able to control, shift, click currency into a trade window to automatically move all of that currency at once from your inventory. Detonate Dead now has clearer telegraphing effects. When harvest crafting, the item hover will always be visible, so you no longer have to mouse back and forth to see the results of your crafts. When you use a Val Orb on a map, the map no longer has a chance to become unidentified. Instead, it adds a new implicit. We've created a set of implicits that affect the areas in fun ways. Related to that, corrupted and mirrored items can now be identified. Breach hands now open upon approach, and no longer need to be clicked. Upgrades to Pantheon powers now apply to all characters in a league. You no longer need to grind divine vessels on each new character. With harvest crafting, you can now re-roll Uber Elder Fragments. Fragments dropped by the Shaper cannot be re-rolled into fragments dropped by the Elder, and vice versa. Regarding Betrayal, we're removing Ashling's crafting bench as a reward. Instead, Veiled Orbs now perform that function. They remove a mod and replace it with a Veiled mod. These orbs now drop from Katarina and are no longer a world drop. Flasks can now be corrupted by Val Orbs, giving random minus 10 to plus 10 quality. The capability to add extra quality to weapons, armors, and flasks has been removed from Betrayal. The Betrayal bench craft that converts an amulet to a talisman has been moved to Bestiary, and thus can be traded. Maven invitations no longer drop. Instead, when you have completed witnessing all bosses required to go to the Maven's arena, you can just talk to Kerak, and he'll open a map device window with the invitation already in there, ready to be rolled. Valdo's maps that granted invitations now give scarabs. No more having to waste Guardian kills to try get invitations to drop. They're dead. But left on their own, men will always seek to take their place. Criminals! Your sentence is to be hanged from the neck until dead. Let your souls feed the first ones, and your bodies feed the land. The only result is pain and death. once more. The 
speed of corruption advances, spreading dread and despair. We must give chase. Gods caused all this, you know. After Oriath was destroyed, I traveled, searching for answers. Everywhere I went, the same divine devastation. It must end. I will end it. And no exile will stop me! Being a spellcaster with a bear form makes sense for Strength Int, but it doesn't really sound like something that a Templar would do. We realized that since we had new mechanics for every attribute combination, it actually made sense to design new character classes to explore the new things. In Peewee 2, every attribute combination has two classes associated with it. Strength Int has the Templar or the Druid, on Dexterity you have the Ranger or the more spear-focused Huntress, and on Dex Int you have the Shadow and the Monk, which Mark is playing here. Each class has its own three ascendancies that let you further specialize the class in the way that only that class has access to, but they both start at the same location in the passive tree. The quest rewards you're offered on the two variants are tailored to the class, but of course, this is POE. You can still mix and match anything to your heart's content. Looks like we've come across the boss for this area. In POE 2, every area of the campaign contains a boss of at least this difficulty. That's over 100 bosses to fight as you make your way through the campaign and they all have unique mechanics to learn. As you've seen from watching Mark fighting, the melee combat in Peewee 2 has a very different feel than before. We've done a lot of things to add mobility to combat. Practically every melee skill in Peewee 2 has some kind of movement built into it. The Monk in particular is a melee fighter who specialises in mobility over brute strength.
So, as Mark has been playing, you might have noticed these blue markers over enemies. Mark has a skill equipped called Killing Palm. Whenever an enemy has a blue indicator over it, it means that the monster is low enough life to cull with Killing Palm. Successfully executing the cull will give you a power charge. This is an important skill for the monk, since many of his skills interact with power charges. One of the great things about the skill is that it has a built-in dash forward, which makes it much easier to target the skill at the right point when you need it. We've done a lot of work in PoE 2 to make using skills like this feel satisfying. If you're accidentally targeting slightly off the monster, the skill will automatically lock on to the cullable target, and will even do a small amount of pathfinding around obstacles. We really want to make sure that when you've got an opportunity to use the skill, nothing is going to get in your way. Once you have some power charges, you need some skills to power up. A great follow-up is Falling Thunder. Falling Thunder without a power charge just creates a relatively small lightning AoE in front of you. But do it with some power charges and it turns into a pack clearer with a large number of extra projectiles. One thing you'll notice here is that like almost every melee skill in PoE 2, Falling Thunder has a bit of extra movement built in just in case you need it. Using the skill within range and you'll do a flip in place. But use it at a larger range and your character will move forward while executing it, getting you into position without any time penalty. In PoE 2 you also get a short period to redirect your target. Notice how you can start the skill facing one way, then whip the mouse sideways to land the skill in a different direction? In order to get power charges, you're going to first need to get some lower life monsters into a cullable range. You've got a few options. If you want to charge right in, Whirling Assault is a good option. It doesn't do much damage per hit, but it covers a lot of ground. And notice how you can turn as you do it? Generally speaking, you never lose control of your character in PoE 2. If you make a turn at the right time, you can get a couple of extra hits in on the monsters, getting them into range of your cull. Follow up with a Killing Palm, then finish off the rest of the pack with your Falling Thunder. We've now entered the Val Mechanarium. This is the place where the Val built the various constructs they relied on to power their civilization. Now this is a find! A Val ruin that hasn't been looted? I wonder why nobody's been in here before. One useful feature that we've added is the ability to call in NPCs to where you are, to give you more information, help you with quest objectives, and so that you don't have to always go back to town. In this case, we'll call in Alva to find out what to do. This mechanism... If powered with a small soul core, it could open that door. There should definitely be soul cores somewhere around here. They had to power these constructs somehow. As Alpha said, we need to find a soul core to open this door. Let's explore. If you want to shave off some life without getting too close to some of the more dangerous monsters, a good option is Wind Blast. Wind Blast also doesn't do too much damage, but it keeps the enemies back. The closer they are, the farther they're pushed back. So it's a great option for keeping smaller, but high damage enemies at bay. Note that the bigger the enemy is, the less they'll be pushed back. So trying to push back some giants isn't going to be effective. And there's the soul core. Let's get back to the door. If you need to defeat tougher enemies, it might be time to break out some of the ice skills in the monk's arsenal. Glacial Cascade creates a wave of ice that moves slowly in front of the player. It's pretty ineffective against fast-moving monsters because most of the damage occurs right at the end of the wave, and so a lot of monsters will just walk right by it. But if you can find a way to make a monster stop at just the right place, it can be very effective. In order to do that, you probably want to freeze monsters. The monk has a few different tools to do this. A fairly simple option is to get right in the monster's face with Ice Strike. Ice Strike doesn't do too much damage on the first two hits, but attack three times in sequence and you can get off a combo that has a much higher chance to freeze. Get in there with that freeze, then roll back and finish the job with a Glacial Cascade. Now, remember how Glacial Cascade had that extra damaging spike at the end? If you've hit a frozen enemy with that spike, it shatters the ice on the enemy and does a devastating amount of damage. Oh yeah, I just uh, casually mentioned rolling back before. Did I forget to mention that in PoE 2 we added a dodge roll to every character? Just press spacebar at any time to roll. 
there's no cooldown, no limitations. It even has a bit of built-in pathfinding so you don't get stuck on things. When you dodge roll, you're not invulnerable. If something hits you, you're going to feel it, but most things will not hit you. That's because while rolling, projectiles and melee strikes will always miss. You'll have to roll out of the way of a slam that has AoE, but anyone swinging a sword or throwing a fireball is going to miss. Now another really important function of the dodge roll is that it lets you cancel out of almost any skill at any time. This makes it so you don't feel like you're getting stuck doing a long animation when something is about to hit you. It really changes how skills with longer attack and cast times play, and it makes dodge roll feel like a very reliable way to avoid attacks. So, that's one way to get out of the way of damage, but the monk specialises in mobility, so it makes sense that he would have a few more. Wave of Frost is one of our new attacks with a retreat built right in. You move backwards and throw out a cold attack with a significant freeze. The great thing about this is it puts you at a good distance to follow up with Glacial Cascade and do a whole pile of damage. Hey look, another Soul Core. Another skill you can use to get some extra freeze is Shattering Palm. Shattering Palm is another palm strike that puts a small ice bomb on your target. Kill or deal enough damage to the target and the bomb will explode, doing some damage and a significant freeze. It's a great option against bosses, where the wave of ice might not be enough to get that freeze off, but you really want to get that Glacial Cascade damage bonus. The final skill we're going to show you today is Flicker Strike. It's a monk skill now, and another skill that consumes power charges. If you've played PoE 1, you know what to expect. It's a great finisher for tough boss fights, and uh, it looks pretty impressive too. Face your demise. Hmm, another door. I wonder what could be in there. In order to take down this boss, we're going to need all the tools in the Monk's arsenal, especially the combo of Freeze and Glacial Cascade. If you're a PoE 1 player, you might think that you can't really rely on Freeze because there's so many bosses that are immune to it, but in PoE 2, that's changing significantly. In PoE 1, Freeze is a binary mechanic. An attack freezes the target, or it doesn't. What this basically means is that in PoE 1, we were forced to add Freeze immunity to many bosses, because Freeze just trivialized them. Because of that, Freezing was something you only really used while pack clearing and not something you could rely on as a core part of your build for boss fight. In PoE 2 though, all crowd control mechanics now have internal meters that allow you to build up to a freeze or stun, or whatever other CC mechanic you might be using. It's a little bit like poise from games like Elden Ring, though the meters tend to be a lot smaller than those games. When you freeze an enemy, it increases the amount of freeze you need to do another freeze, but the increased difficulty bleeds away slowly. More freeze will always let you freeze the boss more often, but this system means it will not get out of control in party play or interact badly with other CC mechanics, allowing us to let these kinds of mechanics actually work against all bosses.
Blackjaw has dropped a consumable quest item, the Flame Core. It's a permanent plus 10 to spirit. In Peewee 2, we really want to make sure that you feel rewarded for exploration. It wouldn't be much good if we made all these awesome optional bosses if we didn't have something great to find for killing them. One of the things you might find for killing a boss is a permanent stat bonus to your character. Your man, come. In order to help us with this next area, we're going to call in a sorceress. Mark's friend, Octavian, is going to send a friend fight which we're going to accept. And then they can play together. The sorceress is the new intelligence-focused character in PoE 2. While the witch focuses more on occult magic and summoning, the sorceress is themed around pure elemental destruction. Let's have a look at how she plays. the largest soul core I've ever seen. With this, we could power the canal systems. But it isn't charged. There is still latent energy in this machinarium from its ancient operation. These lines in the stonework should lead to generators. You might need to find some more soul cores to spin them up, but everything looks to be in surprisingly decent condition. Maybe the golems have been maintaining it. In any case, it should still function. We'll have to remove that large core from the wall, of course, but that shouldn't be a problem. We have some skills here that you'll probably recognise if you've played Pee Wee 1 before, but they feel a bit different to play now. Spark is great in these tight passages, and it bounces around. We've added a Pierce support gem to really allow it to hit an entire room of targets. For a more single target focus skill, Arc is a good choice. It does more damage to the first target you hit. Now, if you find yourself surrounded, it might be good to use Ice Nova. It hits all enemies around you and slows them down with chill. Just be careful, getting up close and personal isn't the ideal place for a sorceress to be. He doesn't have the defences of a more melee oriented character. If you want to help with the sorceress's weak melee defence though, you could use Arctic Armour. In Peewee 2, Arctic Armour is a buff that builds up as you stand still. You can see the ice crystals forming around the character. They'll drop off if you walk. When monsters hit you, they take cold damage and build up to a freeze, so it's a great defense. Just be careful, you have to be standing still for a little while to get the full effect, so trying to start a step isn't the best strategy. Now, Arctic Armor is an ongoing buff, but did you notice it didn't reserve any mana? How does that work? Well, we were pretty sick of the fact that in Peer We Won, basically every character was playing with no mana pool, so we decided to change the way that reservation works. There's a new resource in Peewee 2 called Spirit. Spirit is a dedicated resource you can use for ongoing effects like Arctic Armor, Heralds, Auras, or even Minions. Everyone starts with 100 Spirit, which is enough for most ongoing effects. But if you want more than one effect, you're going to need some more Spirit. Spirit is available on mods from items and on the passive tree. But if you're willing to give up your offhand slot, the easiest way to get it is by holding a Scepter. Now, if you want to increase the cold damage you're dealing, you can use a Frost Bomb. It places a bomb on the ground that reduces the enemy's cold resistance while it's ticking down. 
it's a great opportunity to use some cold skills before it explodes. And speaking of cold skills, a great skill to use on monsters with the slower cold resistance is Comet. This is a new skill in PoE 2, and it hits pretty damn hard. It costs a lot of mana and has a really long cast time, but it's worth the wait. It does a devastating amount of damage. To help get you out of danger, your character moves back slightly as it casts. It's pretty hard to hit a fast moving opponent, but it's great on tougher enemies that stand still, or even a larger pack if you're further away and can predict where they're going to move. Now, if you run into mana casting too many of those, I guess in an emergency you could cast your free to cast fireball. Where did that come from you ask? Well this is a great opportunity to explain the way we've changed caster weapons in PoE 2. Now in PoE 1, caster weapons had a default melee attack that nobody used, and because they had that, they also had a bunch of attack mods that would spawn in them that were useless to a caster. In PoE 2 we wanted to clean that up, so now each staff comes with a built in free to cast spell. Just put it on and spam to your heart's content. Now this particular staff is the base type that you get right on the starting beach, and it's quite likely that you're going to outgrow it, so that's why we have a lot of staves with more utility focused powers for casters to use. Here we have a crystal staff, it's got a pretty cool built in spell called Unleash. Using it slams your staff on the ground, and will allow you to triple cast whatever you cast with your next spell. Now of course you're probably going to want to use that with something powerful, and Comet is a great option. You'll notice that Unleash is one of the few skills in PoE 2 with a cooldown. In general, we really try to avoid using cooldowns, because we really hate the feeling that combat is just waiting to be able to use your next skill. But it does make sense for Unleash, since it's free to cast, and it's something we want you to be using situationally anyway. Now, if you're facing something tough, you might want to try out Mana Tempest. Mana Tempest creates a circle of power in which your character literally hovers over the ground. While in the circle, your mana drains, but it powers up all of your spells. Lightning projectiles fork, beams chain further, and you'll also do a lot more damage. So with all of these skills, here's a great combo to try. First cast Frost Bomb to reduce the target's cold resistance, then use Mana Tempest to increase your damage, follow up with Unleash and then triple cast the Comet to do a truly insane amount of damage. This rare monster dropped an uncut gem. This is a good opportunity to talk about how skill gems drop in PoE 2. Instead of dropping specific gems, you can find uncut gems. Just right click on them and pick whatever skill you want. The gem will come pre-leveled to the level of the area that dropped it, so it's a lot easier to change between skills in PoE 2. This time I think it might be cool to grab one of our meta gems. Meta gems are skills that can have other skills socketed into them, changing how they work. In this case we're going to select Cast on Shock. Let's equip this thing in the skill screen and choose a spell to trigger with it. I think Comet might be fun. Because Cast on Shock reserves Spirit, we'll need to first disable our Arctic Armor. We have to decide if we'd rather have the extra defense or the extra offense of the Cast on Shock using our Spirit. In PoE 2, trigger gems use a system of filling up cast time on each trigger. Basically, if a skill has a short cast time, then we'll trigger it really often. If it's got a long cast time, like this Comet here, it will take a lot longer to trigger. You can see up the top left, there's a counter that says how far it is until your next trigger. And there you are, using Cast on Shock will automatically cast Comet whenever we're using our lightning skills. So we've found the generator, time to power it up. power is restored to the Mechanarium, all the constructs are coming back to life. We'll need to fight them on the way back to the charged soul core. One thing that PoE 1 players might have noticed is that this character has both ice and lightning spells. That's pretty inefficient isn't it? 
It's a big no-no for most builds, because any specialization into cold or lightning isn't going to affect the other element, and generic elemental damage increases are not going to be as powerful as focusing on a single element. Well, in PoE2 we have another major new system to introduce to solve these kinds of problems, and it starts with Weapon Swap. Now in PoE1, Weapon Swap isn't really used much for its originally intended use case. We imagined that people were going to be swapping in and out between different weapons to deal with whatever situation they were in. People just don't do that at all, and a large reason for that is because it's really awkward to do. In PoE2 we wanted to solve that. The staff Octavian is using here has an ice mod on it that makes it great for when he's using his ice spells. We would also like to be able to make sure that the build works just as well for his lightning spells. If Octavian equips his previous staff in his second weapon set, you can see that it appears on the character's back. Now we're going to open up the skill screen. If Octavian opens up the skill options for his lightning skills, you can see here that you can choose which weapon sets are usable with each skill. First, we uncheck set 1 from being used by his lightning skills. Then we go through the cold skills and turn those off with his lightning weapon. Now, when we use Spark, the character will automatically switch to the lightning staff on his back, and then use the skill. When Octavian uses Ice Nova, his character automatically switches over to his Ice Staff before using it. Figure each skill for which set to use, or both if you don't mind which. There's a very short time penalty to switching, so it can be good to leave some skills on both sets if it doesn't matter which weapon set you're using. But we still have the problem of passives. Wouldn't it be nice if we could specialise in both cold and lightning passives on the character? Well in Peewee 2 you can. We're on the passive skill screen here, and you can see that we're close to both a cold and a lightning cluster. At the top right of the screen, you can see where we have some weapon set specific points to allocate. If Octavian holds shift, he can allocate set 1 to the cold passives, and then allocate set 2 to the lightning passives. Now check this out. As we weapon swap, our passive tree changes from one build to the other automatically. Whenever we cast the appropriate spell, the character's passives reconfigure on the fly to the correct build for that spell. Now you can't do this with every passive on your tree. Only points granted from skill books will allow this kind of dual specialization. So you can't change from a mace slamming warrior into a fire elementalist with the press of a button, but it certainly increases the number of options you have for builds. There's a huge number of places where the system can shine. You could augment your dagger shadow build with traps, or have a great curse setup on your witch in one spec and then move to your chaos debuff spells with the other. It really opens up your options. I need more time. Another fun meta gem to try out is called Barrier Invocation. This works a little bit like the trigger gem I talked about before, but this one charges up as your energy shield is hit by monsters. I think we might like to put an ice nova in this one. The more energy shield you lose, the more charge builds up until the point where you're able to cast the skill you socketed instantly. Lose some energy shield, and then at just the right time invoke Ice Nova to cast all the stacked up versions in one cast. If you keep losing shield, you'll build up even more charge for even more casts, so it's a great defensive option in an emergency. Here we are, back at the charged soul core. All we have to do now is take it. How hard could that be? Oh, oh dear. Uh, now we just have to remove it from that construct. I'll uh, give that to you.
Path of Exile 2, we have crossbows that work like sniper rifles, shotguns, and assault rifles. But in order to really get shooter-like gameplay, we wanted to go further. In Path of Exile 2, we now support WASD movement. You can now walk around in any direction independent of aiming. In fact, if this is your preferred method of gameplay, you can use it on any class, regardless of what weapon type you're using. You can change between click to move or WASD at any time. You can only hold two crossbows at a time, but Path of Exile 2 is all about interesting combinations of abilities. And this is where ammo skills come in. This is a burst shot crossbow, and right now I have armor piercing ammo equipped, which makes it very effective when facing a group of enemies, since it pierces right through them. Bloody horrors! But there are other ammos too. For a bigger single target, it might be a good idea to switch to incendiary. The more projectiles hit the target, the stronger the ignite, so you'll want to get up nice, close and personal with this one. If you have a bunch of targets running at you, you might want to slow them down. In this case, you could switch to permafrost burst shot. Shooting a bunch of smaller enemies at range will chill them, and potentially even freeze them in place. Once you have some frozen enemies though, you can switch back to armor piercing. Shooting a frozen enemy with armor piercing burst shot will explode the ice, doing a huge amount of damage to all nearby enemies. Another feature crossbows have is attachments. This is a grenade launcher. As you can see, when I equip it, it appears on the underside of the crossbow. These attachments are just like skill gems, so you effectively get extra skill slots. And you can augment these with support gems, just like regular skills. These grenades take a while to explode, so it's a good idea to pair them with some kind of crowd control, like permafrost burst shot. We have other grenades too though. This attachment is a flash grenade. It does barely any damage, but it does a huge amount of stun. It can be a great opener before you run into combat. Surprise! Now, here's another attachment, an oil grenade. Firing one of these grenades coats the ground and nearby enemies in oil. Oil slows enemies down, so it's another useful crowd control mechanic. Now, another thing that oil can do is be set on fire. Any burning enemy or explosion will ignite the oil, causing extra burning damage. One of the problems with burst shot crossbows is that each pallet doesn't do much damage individually. This means that if enemies have armor, then it will be very effective preventing that damage. But thankfully, you can equip an additional crossbow in your second weapon set to deal with the weaknesses of your primary weapon. This is a rapid shot crossbow. Rapid shot is great for closing on enemies because you can shoot while running. In Path of Exile 2, we now have the ability to allow you to use some skills while moving. Being able to create skills like this opens up a lot of new design space, and allows us to really increase the pace of combat. The armor-piercing version of Rapid Shot slowly erodes a monster's armor. Once the armor is fully broken, you can easily switch back to Burst Shot to deal much more damage. Being able to run while shooting with Rapid Shot is also great for when you want to perform a fighting retreat. Reload. Using Permafrost ammo with Rapid Shot is also useful if you need to retreat. When you shoot the ground, it creates ice crystals. If you draw monsters back over these crystals, they explode, chilling the monsters. It's great if you want to set up a safe zone before pulling the next pack.
Slowing enemies down can come in handy if you want to use the incendiary version of Rapid Shot. Using this skill requires that you charge up a little bit before it fires, but as it continues to heat up it will do more and more damage. It has a really large clip size, so you can just keep firing and firing with it. But the other really useful feature is that when the crossbow is heated up, it adds extra fire damage to any grenade that you launch. Now I've been using explosive grenades here, but it will work equally as well with flash or oil grenades too. If you use it with oil grenades, the oil will catch fire immediately. Another crossbow type that you can find is Power Shot. This one works just like a classic sniper rifle. Use it with armor piercing ammo and it will penetrate armor on targets. So it's a good idea to use when something's really tough. Back down or die. Now this skill has another interesting interaction with armor break. If an enemy has its armor broken then your Power Shot hits a weak spot and does a huge amount of single target damage with a bunch of extra stun for good measure. Bullseye. Now, the incendiary version of Power Shot is more like a rocket launcher. It does a big explosive blast at a distance. One of the really useful features of this version is that you can explode any grenades that happen to be on the ground. This combo also works really well with incendiary rapid shot. I'm going to charge up the heat on my crossbow, shoot out a bunch of grenades and then start the fireworks with a power shot. The ice version of Power Shot creates frost walls at a distance. This is great for crowd controlling monsters and tight passages. The wall segments have other uses too. If they get destroyed by monsters then they will explode, doing a small amount of damage. Now, remember that burst shot combo with frozen enemies we did earlier? That works with ice walls too. Let's put burst shot back on. Now I can fill up this area with ice walls, then shoot them with armor piercing burst shot for a huge amount of damage. Alright, it's time to face the boss for this area. Let's see how we fare against her with all the skills I've shown you so far. Take this! 
transformation in PoE 2 happens automatically when you use a bear attack. Use Bear Maul and your character will transform into a bear and do a meaty swing. Use a spell and your character transforms back into a human and casts it. Hitting enemies with the bear's maul attack will build up rage, which increases your attack damage, so your bear gets stronger with every attack. You can see the glowing runes that indicate rage on your back. Have a lot of weak enemies to take out? This is where you probably want to break out your rampage. Let out a roar and stampede over all enemies in your path, slamming the ground with your paws. The initial roar generates rage, and then the rage is consumed as you charge along. You can use Rampage by itself to travel a short distance, or do some mauling first to build up some rage and travel a significant distance. Now, while the bear is big and strong, this isn't a pure strength class. You don't have as much armor as a warrior would have. In order to protect itself from larger packs, you might want to consider a skill like Furious Slam. This skill is all about stunning rather than damage, so it's quite useful if you're mobbed by smaller monsters and just need to get out of there. Of course, like any PoE2 character, you can always use a dodge roll to get out of danger, since the bear is the slowest of the druid's forms. Making sure the dodge feels reliable and can get you out of any situation is paramount. When you dodge an animal form, your character instantly transforms back with no time penalty, so that you can get out of the way. You can even interrupt a mistimed transformation halfway through. Of course, doing this will mean you pay the slight time cost of having to transform back again, but it's certainly a lot better than dying. Something interesting about the skill is that it's faster to use if you're already standing up. If you're on all fours when you use Furious Slam, then the bear has to stand up first before slamming back down. But use Maul first and the bear will stand up as you swing, which has no time penalty. Then follow up with Furious Slam and your bear will quickly slam down. Much more efficient. Next up, I want to talk about Ferocious Roar. Ferocious Roar is a bear meta skill gem. It allows you to take any Warcry skill that another class like the Warrior might use and allow you to use it as a bear. I'm going to take the Seismic Cry gem and socket it into Ferocious Roar. You can actually socket more than one Warcry and use them all together, but let's just stick to one for now. Seismic Cry pushes enemies back and has some stun chance but the reason we want to use it is for a mechanic called Exerted Attacks. If there are any heavily stunned enemies in range of the Warcry, then your next slam skill will be powered to do double the number of slams. First, I use Furious Slam to stun these enemies. Next, I follow up with Seismic Cry and get the Exerted Attack, and then I slam again. See how two slams triggered? So, that's all well and good, but how about we try that again using Rampage. First, get a bit of Rage, slam to stun the enemies, Seismic Cry to get the exert, and then Rampage around to do insane amounts of damage. So we've covered some of the bear side of the druid, but how is he as a spellcaster? Now of course we want to maximize the amount of time you spend in your animal forms, so most of the spells targeted at the druid tend to be things that last a long time, or provide tactical options on the battlefield. The first and probably simplest of these is Lightning Storm. Pass it on the ground and you get an area where monsters are continuously struck by bolts of lightning. The bolts don't do much damage, but they shock monsters, which is a debuff that increases all damage on them, meaning it's a great spell to use before going in as a bear. So, that's going to increase your damage, but as I mentioned before, the bear form of the druid could use some defenses as well. The bear in particular is the slowest attacking of the druid's forms. He hits hard, but if he gets swarmed too much, it will result in your death. That's why Tornado is so useful. Tornado sucks monsters in, allowing you to split up packs and deal with groups separately, or pin monsters in place and set up combos with your other skills. The Tornado doesn't really move big monsters much, so you can actually use it to separate a boss from its minions too. The Druid also has the ability to summon animal companions. This is another really useful defense because wolves can take aggro from you, keeping monsters away. In addition, the wolves howl as they are summoned, putting a temporary debuff on enemies that makes them more vulnerable to critical strikes, and giving you a reason to resummon them in combat. 
The last druid spell we're going to talk about today is Volcano. You can cast it quickly like this and it will spawn just a few projectiles. Or you can hold down the button to channel it for longer, which will make it fire a whole bunch of projectiles when it spawns, doing a lot more damage. The Volcano sticks around firing its little projectiles for a long time, so it's another good skill to cast before turning into a bear. Now, the reason you're going to want to turn into a bear after using Volcano is that any slam near the Volcano results in it spewing out even more projectiles. And if you thought that was a lot, then Rampage is even better, because it does two slams every time it hits the ground. And you can run around the Volcano. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might have realised that this is going to be extra good with Seismic Cry, which we were using earlier to double the number of slams. So, first we're going to cast Volcano. Then Furious Slam till you stun something, Seismic Cry to get the double slams, then Rampage around while the Volcano spews out a stupid number of projectiles. This combo would have been even better if we'd remembered to cast our Lightning Storm first, but getting time for that seems tricky. It would also have been nice if the monsters were affected by the crit debuff that my wolves do when I first summon them. This is where some meta gems to automate some elements can come in handy. Here's a gem called Cast While Channeling. If we add Lightning Storm to the skill, we can cast it automatically while we channel a volcano as we set up our combo. Cast While Channeling is an ongoing effect, so enabling the skill will cost us Spirit, which is a new resource in PoE2 used specifically for these kinds of skills. If you look at the top left of the screen as we channel, we can see the energy building up to cast the Lightning Storm. As long as we channel Volcano for long enough, the Lightning Storm will also be cast on the same targeted location. Currently, Cast While Channeling is active in Reserving Spirit in both our human and bear forms. This means that any channeling skills we use as a bear technically will also cast the Lightning Storm. We can actually do this with Rampage right now, but it's not the best because we would prefer to stack the Lightning Storm on top of our Volcano, rather than just casting it randomly as we're rampaging around. We're also unnecessarily reserving spirit in our bear form we could be using for something else. So let's fix that. I'm going to go into the skill options for the skill and disable it in my bear form. We showed at ExileCon how you could use skill options to control which weapon set to use when casting skills. But you can also use the same interface to enable or disable which buffs you would like to have active in your different weapon sets too, without having to recast them all the time. And shapeshifting counts as a weapon set. Now when I change to a bear, the effect and the spirit reservation goes away, and when I change back to a human again, it's back automatically. So, now that we have some extra spirit available as a bear, why don't we make our life a little bit easier by automating one of our other skills? This is the Cast on Melee Stun meta gem. I'm going to put Summon Wolf in Cast on Melee Stun, so that whenever I stun a sufficient number of enemies while I'm a bear, it will summon another wolf. This is great, because usually when I'm stunning, it's because I'm about to do my exerted attack slam combo. When wolves come out, they howl, adding the crit debuff to the monsters, right when I need it. It also helps keep my wolves alive and summoned at all times without me having to do it manually. So, last but not least, let's talk about the skill tree. At ExileCon we showed how you could dual spec your character so that different weapons can use different passives. Well, as I said before, the bear form counts as another weapon set for specialization purposes. So he gets a tree too. If I open my passive tree, you can see how I'm near a melee damage cluster and a spell damage cluster. By holding shift, I can allocate these passives in my human form, and these ones as a bear. Now, when I change between human and bear form, my passives reallocate automatically. So, here we are at the blind beast. The goblins have enslaved a huge behemoth and gouged out its eyes. Now they're sending it in to fight you while they watch. What have they done to this creature?